Hey folks, welcome to the OLS 6 um, Open Science uh, Cohort Call. OLS 4, week 6 Open Science Cohort Call. We're not an OLS 6 yet. One day, one day. Um, so uh, I'm going to do my usual bits before we kick off the call. Um, so first of all, today we're talking about a different open science project development uh, methods, techniques, and project management related things as well. Um, so uh, as you have noted, this call is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube probably around about Monday next week. Um, and we have uh, breakout rooms in this call. So we'll, I will ask you briefly to edit your name in Zoom to express your preference for written or uh, spoken breakout rooms. Um, and as a reminder, the way to do that is in the participants panel on Zoom. You click on your name, click on the more button and click rename. Uh, if you prefer written breakout rooms, add W before your name. And it, that's uh, what you can see on my name at the moment. If you prefer spoken breakout rooms, add S before your name. Um, and if you can't do it, don't worry too much. We'll ping you just to find out what your preference is instead. Um, the call is being transcribed. And this means on the top right, top left, I am terrible with this. If someone says turn right, I'll go the wrong way and we'll get lost. On the top left of your screen, um, where it says live on Otter AI, you can use that to follow along with what's being said during the call. Um, so we will cover um, in this call open software, open hardware, open data, and uh, developing projects. Um, and we have a code of conduct as well that we ask everyone to um, pay attention to when we're participating in the call. So there's information about that right now. It's on line 92. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to read through that, please do take a few minutes after the call to take a look. Um, as a general rule, if you believe that you have experienced or witnessed anything that you would consider unacceptable or not in line with the code of conduct, um, you can report that uh, to myself, Malvika, or Emmy, or Berenice. Um, and there's a team email, team at openlifesci.org, or our individual emails. Using either is fine, depending on your preferences. Um, and I think I've done all of the core kickoff bits. So, Emmy, I think you're doing the next section. Over to you. Thank you, Yo. All right, let's get started with open science. Um, what is open life science without open science, right? Open science is uh, has many aspects. You probably know some of them. We mentioned some of them, a lot of them, on in the second week in our introduction. But we'll dive right into them in the into the lovely details uh, over three calls. So this is the first one. Um, it's going to be second one in week ten, and the third one I don't remember when anymore, but later in the program. Um, we this call we're going to learn something about something called iterative project management. Don't worry if that makes no sense to you for now. Um, we'll, we'll also have a speaker who will tell us all about it, but we'll also see how that and other project management skills are applied by looking at three case studies. So today we'll hear uh, about open data and research data management, about open source software, and then also about open source hardware. And then in week 10, there we'll talk a little bit more about open dissemination. So that's one thing you want to take from today. A lot of people think open science is all about the end, the output. It's not. Open science is much, as much about the output as it is about the development of the project. And we'll see that throughout today, hopefully, uh, through listening to our lovely speakers. So i um, not going to wait anymore. Very, very excited today to have Sarah with us, who's going to talk about research data management. Sarah, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm super thrilled to, to be talking to you all today. Just a second, I'll share my screen. Um, do let me know if there are any issues. Okay, off we go. So, uh, hi, my name is Sarah Elgibelli. I'm a project leader for Metadata and Curation. I've previously held roles in research data management and uh, scientific bio curation. Uh, so today I, I'm going to start off by asking, uh, answering a question that I frequently get asked, which is what is research data management and what do we do? So research data management refers to the process of organizing, storing, preserving, and sharing data collected during a research project. But this also includes uh, the everyday management of the data 
during the lifetime of the research project and well beyond the project completion. So this includes things, for instance, like where the data will be deposited, how will it be shared and so on. So the way I see it, research data management is an integral and embedded part of the research process. And to that end, you're usually hear us talking about supporting researchers towards two end goals, fairness and openness. Um, so what is fair? And um, to start with, fair is a set of principles to, that defines best practices for data and software to facilitate discovery, access and reuse by both humans and machines. It's not a set of rules per se, it's not a standard, but an evolving process and a vision. And th this is why we usually talk about, about it in the, in the sense of levels of fairness. So what does FAIR stand for? Findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Findable means that your data should be findable by both yourself and others. And in that sense, it means your data should be available in a discoverable resource, have appropriate descriptions, and have a persistent identifier. Accessible means that your data should be accessible for both humans and machines alike, should be retrievable and understandable. Uh, when it comes to interoperable, we usually ask ourselves this question, will a machine understand what I'm saying? With the advancement of AI and machine learning, we do want the machines to be able to accurately understand and interpret the data. And this is one of the most important, but also the most difficult principle to apply. Finally, we come to reusable. So essentially, everything you, you do in the findable, accessible, interoperable part is the is the ultimate aim out of it is to make it reusable for, again, yourself and others. How does that differ from open though? Open is the data, the, the agreed upon definition here is that open is the data that can be freely used, reused and redistributed, subject only to the requirements of attribution. So in practical terms, FAIR means Thinking about the people who could benefit from your data, and again, yourself included. And I'll, I do emphasize this for one reason that I'll come to it, uh, to it later on. And, but when we talk about open data, we generally think of data that is freely available online. It's out there and can be downloaded without having to pay for it or, you know, or behind any uh, restrictions. But the two things do not mean the same thing. So FAIR is not exactly the equivalent of open, but open needs to be FAIR in order to be useful. So making your data and software available freely and openly does not exactly mean that it's in a good shape to be used by others. And this is why we stress the reusability part in FAIR. And, but to do this, we need to, to be able to make it in a good shape to be made available uh, for reuse and repurpose, we need clear, detailed, contextual information, which we call and data description. That's metadata. Um, another thing is that, again, FAIR does not equate open because FAIR means the data just needs to be reusable ultimately and findable, accessible, interoperable, right? But what happens to private sensitive data and patient data? You need this data to be in a good shape, but you don't necessarily need it to be out there. So the idea here is to have it as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. So the ideal situation is that you want the fair data both fair and shared openly. Keeping in mind the restrictions that it may not always be possible to share things openly. So why do we want to make things fair? One good reason is that you are the first person to reuse your own data. And this might be enough reason for you to adopt best research management practices. We need to understand what we did a year ago, right? But also, we don't work alone. Research is is not done alone. We, we work in collaborations, we work with teammates, 
And all of these people around us in our ecosystem need to understand what we did. Now, to ask the question of uh, why do we need to open? Because at this point, we've been doing research for over half a century, and it is extremely disheartening to see examples of basic, fundamental research being behind the paywall. Why do we allow this to happen? And why do we allow it to continue to happen? What would, we need to be part of the solution and proactively contribute to making science available to everyone. And to everyone means really everyone, not just those who have the means to, to access it. And keeping that in mind, having a vague or discouraging data access request is not a solution. Having a proper data access uh, uh, statement is, a, is a, absolutely a key. You need to outline what you need from the users for requesting access, as well as outlining how they're expected to use this data. So I usually like to share this example from CERN because it's really heartwarming and it's one of my favorite examples, which acts as a reminder of why we're doing this. CERN reminds us that open source and open uh, open access and open science as a whole is the building block to major achievements and innovations. So having that motto on their website and reminding us that open science is for the benefit of society at large really restores my faith in the world and in what we do. So, um, to that, I hope you're asking at this point, like, what can I do on, on a personal level, on an individual level? What can we do? Of course, I would say, first, be fair. And to how, how do I do this? We need to invest our time and effort and, uh, into, into doing this. So there are ways outline how, how to get there, right? Deposit your data where others in your field can find it and for that like find specific repositories and with unique identifiers and uh, make your data and metadata accessible via standard means. Create metadata and explain it in detail and never assume that people know what, what you mean, right? Um, deposit metadata and, and both with, with a persistent identifier and make it available even without the data itself. And we see this in cases for heavily protected data. You have patient samples, you have private or sensitive data, you don't necessarily need to put it out there. Um, pretty sure in many cases, you are restricted to putting it out there openly, but do describe what you have. So having that metadata and descriptions available is absolutely important, just as important as sharing the data itself. Include information of ownership and provenance. Outline what people are allowed and not allowed to do. So sharing the right license, um, choosing the right license, sorry, and specify access conditions. So what do they need to do in order to access that information? and describe it in a standardized fashion. We can use many words to describe the same thing. And that's why there's agreed terminologies and vocabularies. Yeah, um, share the data in a preferred and open format. And I'll come to that in a second as well. And the most important thing you can do is start this early on. It will save you a ton of time and effort later on. So let's be fair and be open. I'm again, as I stressed out that we're not always we're, we can't always be open, but um, if you can, then cho choose a license that allows you to be open because leaving it without a license does not mean that people are allowed to do anything with it. Actually, leaving it with no license is, is equivalent of zero access. So whether you have data or software, there are different ways to choose the right license, but one of the main things you can do is to check if your institute has an open research license. If, you, if you're unsure, speak to your research data managers and your librarians, they would be the first people to know. 
if the if if they on an institutional level you do not have a license, check the funder's requirements because most funders nowadays do have an open sharing uh, requirement. Worst case scenario, there is none of these. I would I would say revel and start your start one, actively campaign for one and join communities out, out there that will help you to bring uh, an awareness to your institute on that matter, so, such as this community and the touring community and many more out there. So anyway, so third thing is be fair, be open and build new habits. And this is something that you can, we can do starting today. And the long, the, the more you do, you, you, you follow this, it becomes like a habit, you won't think about it. So what, what can you do? clear director structure that will make life easier. It will make it easier to find files and versions um, of choosing the right um, file names. I should be able to know what this file is about before even double clicking it, right? And that's the common rule of thumb. During your research, you might be restricted to the choice of file formats that is like dictated by the convenient, convenience or an instrument or even your team. But when it comes to the point where you're sharing the files out to the open or with others, use file formats that are most commonly used in your field and open ones. This allows interoperability and don't get vendor locked as well. So 10 years down the line, you might not be able to open the same file. So keep that in mind for yourself as well. Um, keeping track of changes of uh, file and, and data sets. Sorry, I'm getting distracted with the chat. <laughs> so uh, I'm almost done. So and then I'll take any questions. So in order to keep track of changes um, made to file data set, choose a versioning strategy early on and just adopt it throughout. And that uh, the same goes for quality control. So which is an, a fundamental step in research and it ensures that the integrity of the data, it ensures the integrity of the data and it could affect its uh, use and reuse down the line. So, and it's very important in, in order to identify potential problems. So think about that. How would you spot problems? How would you deal with them? And how would you test for 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 for, for, for that early on in the, re in, uh, the project, project start and outline those strategies and write it down. And speaking of writing down things, document everything. Uh, Again, it's not just for others to tell them what you're doing. Remind yourself, because I don't know what I've done a year ago. So um, I'm, so this effort is, is very important. Tell people what you've done, write it down, the main things, who did what, when, and how, and why, and which parameters, and everything. So um, I know this This is a huge, uh, uh, there, there, there's a huge, like, uh, amount of advice here I could give you, but I don't I don't necessarily have the time today. So I'm going to leave you with a tons of resources uh, in the presentation. Uh, so please feel free to go deep um, into the details. And if you need anything, just uh, or if you have any questions, just reach out and get in touch with my with me and I'd be happy to to, to answer them. And uh, the resources are attached to this presentation. So I hope I, I made it on time. So thank you all so much for uh, for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. That is a very, very succinct and, and clear and resourceful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions already, so I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, feed them through. But um, folks, if you have more questions, now is a good time to put them on the Zoom chat or in the Etherpad under line 127 at the moment. So we have a question from the Etherpad, what to do if the data set is very large and it takes a lot, lot, a lot of hard disk space to store or a long time to download. Um, and then there's another problem where the repositories only take data that is associated with the publication. So I guess both, both things, Sarah, if you could, you know, Help us out a little bit and, and give us some advice. Uh, okay, so if the data is very large or takes a lot of hard disk space to store, um, yeah. So institutional, the institute has a wh where wherever you're working, 
they have a mandate to keep the data for a specific timeline. So for instance, uh, they need to have the data uh, well stored in like for 10, 15 or 20 years. This differs on the Institute and what regulations. So they are the primary place. That's the primary place where, where who's responsible for storing and archiving the data. So you need to, to like get in touch and, and check with them if they can allocate you enough uh, hard disk space. I know there are people who opt to getting their own like homemade solutions like um, uh, external hard drives and whatnot. There are backup strategies. Uh, to be to 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 deal that you need to think about in order to ensure that the, uh, the solution is is a um, like is good enough and and yeah and you don't end up in problem with data loss for instance so um, problem with repositories only taking associated data associated with the publication um, so. It, it depends on the repositories, right? And we have general repositories where you can we can deposit the data. And there are instances, for instance, you have Figshare where you, if you can you can upload uh, well annotated data, um, it open to be openly available for people to 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 benefit of. I'm not entirely sure if they have any requirements for it to be associated with a certain publication. I'm not. I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure, but there are a number of repositories and actually uh, you can in, in one of my resources, you can uh, there's a repository chooser. So a link to repository chooser. So I'm, I'm yeah, I don't know it on top of my head. Sorry. I hope that answers the question. Another any other questions? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, uh, Aaron, maybe you can let us know if that answers the question if you have a follow up. Um, just one more. Uh, I think it was Saranji to ask uh, Is it okay to have both a CC BY license as well as a, a, an MIT license on a project repository? Um, what would be the, the, the case to need two licenses? I mean, it, probably like one would be associated with the data and the other would be associated with the software, right? Um, but you'll have to double check the exact wording of both licenses that they don't conflict each other. So which CC by exactly that you're choosing and uh, um, yeah, if they are associated with different items, I don't see an issue, but, but outline it clearly that which license is associated with which object. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good advice in general. Um, if anyone has any experience with this, um, please also do share them yeah. um, either in the chat or in the ether part. We'd love to know. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thanks, a lot. But thanks for joining us. Um, I see also that Lasana shared some um, a very useful uh, resource for data versioning and archiving as well. That's 129 in the notes. And also, um, sorry, I don't know who this is, but uh, yeah, there's an escape room um uh activity elisa thank you uh that you can check out um it's from the Freie university amsterdam uh leiden and open all of netherlands uh, it takes 45 minutes to play it's a lot of fun and you learn all about research data management so do check yeah. it out if you have some spare time fantastic um, okay thank you so much i'll have to run uh for another meeting but it's so good to see some uh, familiar faces and uh good, best of luck <laughs> and do get in touch if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Bye. Okay. All right. Um, moving on, uh, we have Sam, who's going to talk about open source software. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me see if I can share my slides. Do you hear me and see the screen OK? Yeah, perfect. OK, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, so um, hi, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm a particle physicist at um, UCL. And I'm also involved in the running of the um, Turing Data Stories project. And I'm going to talk about um, mostly open source in research contexts. So um, what is free and open source software, which is often abbreviated to FOSS or FLOSS? So the first thing to recognize is that um, open source and free are not synonymous. 
So you can have free software that is not open source. So this is like um, free freeware programs you can download and, and run the, the program itself, but you're not given access to the underlying source code. Uh, and it might also be illegal to modify the software um, due to the specifics of the license. And conversely, you can have um, open source software that isn't free. So you can have licenses which charge people for the use or modification of your um, open source software. And then where these two um, categories intersect is the free and open source software um, uh, part of the Venn diagram. And this is really like the gold standard for um, research software development. So what is open source? Open source is really just simply making your work available to others uh, and also licensing your work so that it can be used by other people how you want it to be used. Um, but crucially, you stay in control when you do this. So for those who want to do this, open source makes it easy for others to reuse and remix your work and build upon it and take it further than you could do. Uh, and you get credit, of course, for, for when people do this. So why, why, why do we want to use and promote um, open source ways of working? So the, the main um, one for me is that uh, when you work in this kind of open environment, you can uh, go further than you could if you were working, if everyone was working in kind of closed environments. So because open source code can be reused and integrated into other projects, uh, you have access to now thousands of open source libraries and programs uh, and can build off them straight away. Um, and that means that you can make applications that are much more than what you could do uh, if that wasn't the case. Uh, and also there's this kind of um, uh, ethic in, built in the open source way of working, which is related to the kind of scientist or hacker ethic, which is based around collaboration. So if you benefit from open source, there's an idea that you should you know, try and give back if you possibly can. And this kind of distributed innovation um, allows, um, allows, you know, other people using your work to, to suggest new features or to notice some bugs that they can report to you. Uh, and basically you get um, peer review of your work if you make it open, which is always a good thing. So in terms of closed code, which is the other way of doing things, this has some risks associated with it, because if you um, write stuff and don't tell anyone about it or don't show anyone what you're doing, then it's possible that you make some mistakes. It's very likely um, that you make some mistakes, everyone does. Um, and then if no one's there to kind of maybe notice these, then um, that's a potential pitfall of not making your work open. And there's some links, well, there's some examples here of uh, um, closed um, projects that uh, could have been maybe improved if they were openly developed. So how do you know if a um, software or a project is open source? So even if the code, um, the source code itself is viewable online, um, it's not um, legal to reuse it unless there's a license which explicitly states that you can do so. Um, so open source software must have a license. Um, and one of the places you will find um, such a license, if there is one, is in the um, repository for the project. Um, so on GitHub, you see in this um, repository information bar on the right hand side, there's a, a kind of view license icon, and that will take you to the license and you can work out um, what exactly you can do with this software. So it's, uh, it's really crucial to add a license to um, your project, the software that you're using, or the data, or you know, photos that you upload, or even like a slide deck. So in terms of fears or reasons potentially that people think this is not a good idea, um, the main one is really that um, people are worried about being scooped. So um, uh, by making your project um, or the code for your research open, um, someone can come along and steal what you're doing and um, you know, maybe take the credit for it and publish something before you can. And really, this is um, not something that happens uh, very commonly, because um, if someone does take your code and um, reuses it and then tries to like publish some results of it, it will be more clear to reviewers that that's what's happened, because you will have a documented record of having published this code um, first. And then that can be noticed as like a trail. 
Um, and if you're still worried about um, people doing this in kind of more surreptitious ways, you can also publish a preprint, which is a way to like stake your claim on the on the work or on the code and document um, that you were first. So um, publishing and sharing open code. So version control is absolutely key here. So the easy way to publish and share code with other people um, so that they can download download your code, reuse it and contribute to it is to use a version control system. And this is really the natural partner of uh, open development. So why do we want to use a version control system? Um, it makes collaborating on code really easy. And this is kind of um, the main benefit of um, working in an open source way is that you can collaborate with other people. And so version control is a natural tool that allows you to, to do this effectively. So you can do things like test out changes within different branches of your repository. You can revert any accidents and recover from any mistakes that have been made. Um, you can quickly integrate changes from um, many, many developers um, uh, very easily. And you can also um, have easy ways of um, backing your project up off site so that you don't lose anything. So um, Git and GitHub is um, really the most widely used uh, version control. Git is the most widely used version control system. GitHub hosts uh, Git repositories. And I'm sure you'll be learning uh, or have learned already about um, all these kinds of tools. But these are really essential for, for working in, in um, open settings. So um, where can you learn these tools? Um, Git is quite a complex um, uh, version control system, um, but you definitely don't need to learn everything in one go. You just need to start with the absolute basics, so how to just make a commit and push and pull from a repository, and then the, less you, the rest you can build up later um, as you go, and as you start to need more advanced tools. So here are just a few uh, steps that you can do to go about making your work um, open. So the first thing is uh, you need to choose a license because having a license is essential for uh, having an open source project. So there's a handy website here called chooseralicense.com, which gives you a kind of um, decision tree flow diagram to help you find uh, the license you might want based on kind of easy questions that it gives you. Um, and there's there's like many different things you might want to allow. You might want to just say anyone can use this for whatever they want, or you might want to say, uh, for example, restrict the use of your um, code for commercial use so that people aren't allowed to make money off it without um, you allowing them to. And there's all these kind of different um, nuances that the license can have. And it's really important that you work out what's best for your needs and for your project, and then to um, find the license that matches that and then put it on your um, repository and so everyone can see it. So um, we talked about the license and then another um, very good thing to do is to have a great readme on your project repository. And this basically should explain the project, what's going on, uh, how people can use the code, how people can contribute to it and also give details and a link to the license. Um, contributing guidelines are also really useful because they allow people who might want to get stuck in and get involved and contribute. Uh, they explain to these people how exactly they can go about doing that. And you might say, we're looking for these types of um, roles in our project and you could maybe fulfill one of these roles. If people have these kind of categories that they can fit themselves into, then it really allows them to, to um, contribute more easily. A roadmap is also great for like drumming up excitement about new features that might be coming um, and also to discuss, you know, developments that, that are ongoing. Um, issues are another essential way of like keeping track of bugs and um, also uh, getting feedback on new features that people want. Um, a code of conduct is useful for making sure this happens in a kind of um, congenial way. Uh, and that any like, disputes can be resolved based on a kind of uh, a framework of interaction. And also it's good to have contact details and information about how the project can be cited as well. So in practice, open source can go further than just um, research software. You can really make anything open. Um, so uh, in, my, um, in my experience, um, I've um, uh, seen firsthand the process of open development through um, working in the Turing Data Stories project. And this project we uh, write um, pedagogic and reproducible data stories and the process of doing this is is fully open um, from the uh, ideas generation stage where we try and come up with new topics of things to write about um, anyone can suggest an idea 
And then also we collaborate openly with people to um, actually write the stories themselves. And then uh, we also have an open peer review process. So um, peer review is um, people looking at your work, but having an open process for that means that your comments and the reviewers themselves are all open. and Anyone can see um, the actual um, process that's going on within the peer review. So a good way to get started is to um, contribute to an open source project yourself. And there's some um, great links here that will uh, help get you started with that. And then finally, um, I'll also leave you with a link to the Turing Way, which is a great resource. And yeah, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, folks, um, if you have questions, please leave them in the Zoom chat um, or in the Etherpad. I think we're underneath 958. It's great to hear also about um, the Turing Data Stories project as well. <laughs> You're saying that uh, you were, uh, yeah, she mentored this project no less too. And yeah, that was yeah. less work. Yeah, <laughs> central as well. <laughs> Very nice. Just give um, folks sort of another five, ten seconds to think about questions. It's a lot that we've covered here. I think there might be a question a bit further down um, under the wrong section on line 170. Uh, it says, can you tell a bit more about the contribution guide on GitHub? Yeah, so the, the contributing guidelines are basically um, if you imagine yourself not knowing um, much about a project, if you just found a new project that you, um, you know, like the look of, think it could be useful to you, but perhaps it needs some um, slight changes to fit with your use case, uh, and you feel like you're in a position to, to make those changes, then the contributing guidelines are going to explain to you how exactly you can participate. So they might say, step one, open an issue, and step two, um, you know, fork the repository and make your changes and um, make a merge request. Um, but it will basically be explaining to, to you or to other people how they can actually, practice, on a practical level, interact with your project. Hope thank that. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's another one that I just saw. Uh, how do you software development practice apply to documentation projects? Can you share some tips maybe? So applying open, so, so applying these um, ideas to the documentation itself. I'm guessing, uh, Mavika, maybe you can help me out here. Um, it's a project that yeah. maybe doesn't include so much code, Mavika. Yeah, I, I was uh, referring to because you do Turing data stories, which are a combination of documentation and the code, and you probably apply different licenses to both. Um, can you share some insight from that if someone is only developing documentation related project? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I guess like a lot of the um, tools at least would carry over because you can um, version control your documentation um, files and that's definitely a good, um, good thing to do. Um, I'm trying to think of what differences there would be. Um, Mm, that's a good one. I'm not sure. I think you kind of answered like probably we can apply most of the rules from the software to documentation. Yeah. Yeah, there may be some differences. I'll have a proper think about it and, and maybe type some some thoughts in the in the document. It's a good question. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Uh... So my last one, um, do you think it's a good idea to link Zenodo with GitHub for citation purposes? Yes, I think Zenodo, uh, although I've not used it um, much myself, um, is a great way of being able to kind of host also um, like stuff that isn't code, so data sets and have them be referenceable uh, alongside the code and to make sure everything's kind of connected. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely a good idea. Oh, we have one more. Um, 
Nadine asks, I'm wondering how one can get code review if there is no one working on my open source project and no one else, for example, supervisors, um, if it's a research project who is willing to have a look at it. Yeah, that's a great question um, and can be difficult as well. I think the, 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 you're in the right place, first of all. So communities like um, these are a great place to find people who might be willing to um, you know, look at your project and look at your code. Um, and maybe you can offer some sort of um, uh, exchange where you, know, um, you um, do something for them as well that they need. You know, maybe they need a, uh, a review on some code as well. Um, so I would definitely leverage your existing networks. Um, definitely, um, OLS is a great place to, to ask for help. Thank you. Um, I'm checking with my co-organizers if we need to move on or can we have one more question? <laughs> one quick question, but then I think we do need to move on. Um, if we have more questions, maybe we put those in the um, etherpad and we can follow up later. Sounds perfect. All right, Harpreet asks, um, many open source projects start well, however, after some time, it becomes difficult to keep things updated and on track. Are there, do you have any suggestions here, Sam? Yeah, so I think what's really crucial is that you start early on before things become a problem of like setting out a lot of um, structure. Um, so this might be, um, you know, really clear contributing guidelines, and maybe at first they seem like a bit unnecessary because you need to jump through so many steps and actually I could just you know make a comment directly to the master branch or something like that but actually these kinds of quick ways of doing things become unsustainable as the size of the project grows so I think starting early on of defining um, a set of best practices and then stick to them early on as well um, then helps set an example for them when people join they they can see things are being done a certain way um, and then they also learn from that how to how to do things. Um, so yeah, I would say like decide your practices early and then stick to them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, thanks for joining us as well um, in the presentation. I am going to hand over to Malika. Thank you, Emmy. And thank you so much, Sam and Sarah, who have wonderfully set tone for what we're going to do now. Uh, so we have our speaker. I'm very uh, happy to introduce Nick Barlow, my colleague from the Alan Turing Institute, who will be talking about agile and iterative project management methods. Uh, so please keep in mind what you just learned about data as and software that Sam were talking about and how that applies uh, through this talk. So Nick, uh, to you now. Thanks, Malvika. Okay, I'm going to try sharing my screen now. Um, hopefully, this will will work. Uh, uh, oh no, can we do that? Um, there's a slideshow. How does that look? Looks great. Cool. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, agile and iterative um, methods. Uh, a disclaimer before I start that I, I would not describe myself by any means as an expert on, on this topic. Um, I have done some some training courses back through the years uh, on, on agile methods. And I have used quite a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about in this talk uh, in some of my own projects. But I'm very happy to stand corrected if someone else knows more about it. And if I say something wrong, then, then please do jump in and, and tell me what, what I'm saying that's wrong and, and help everyone uh, learn what's right. So to talk about agile um, and what it is, personally, I think it's maybe easiest to talk about what it's not. Uh, so it's kind of, it was developed as a reaction against uh, the sort of traditional way of planning and executing projects, uh, which is sometimes known as the waterfall method. I guess because you can imagine if you see these blocks on the right, then you can you kind of go from one to the next one when it's finished. And it's kind of, you can imagine water flowing over the blocks down to the bottom. So in this method, you can start off uh, with gathering your, your requirements, then you have a design phase, then you have an implementation phase and verification and maintenance. And you kind of more or less wait for one to be done before you start the next one. So you kind of have a lot of upfront um, work, gathering all the requirements, documenting it, documenting all the decisions that this will then uh, lead to. Same for your design, you have to plan everything out in advance, um, sort of make sure you have a good idea of what, what your product's gonna look like um, before you ever start implementing anything. So everything is very much upfront uh, focused in, in this sense. 
So, you know, is this good or bad? I mean, it's actually, you know, it's been done for a long time. It's, a, it's probably a bit of both. So I tried to sort of enumerate some advantages and disadvantages. So, you know, a good thing about it is like generally every step of this stage will produce a document and, and that's good to sort of keep track of what you're doing. Um, your stakeholders can read these documents. They can sort of probably comment on them and feedback and you can change your design before you start wasting time building something they don't want. Um, and you can also sort of budget as well. So, you know, if you have a design which says, okay, we're going to need this many people for this long, and then this many people for this long to do this thing, everyone has a clear idea well in advance of what, what's going to be needed when, and they can, you know, schedule things and, and budget things accordingly. So that all sounds pretty good. Um, there are disadvantages as well, though. So one of them is the same as the advantage. It produces really a lot of documentation, and probably a lot of this is never going to get read. Probably a lot of it will be obsolete by the time um, the project's done. And it's kind of just a drain on resources to actually produce, read, um, you know, verify and check all this documentation. Um, probably the more, more important one and the crucial one uh, is that any estimate you ever make in advance of how long something's going to take, how much it's going to cost, how many people you need for it, when you need those people, is going to be wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of any project basically that's ever gone according to plan if you sort of plan everything up in advance so you know that does mean that although you can produce a plan and you can produce a sort of um you know a sort of idea of what you're going to need when actually maybe it's more harmful because it's it's completely wrong and you have people at the wrong time um another very important one again is that projects if they if you're wrong about how long it's going to take you're almost always wrong in that you're going to overrun you know you very rarely underrun and so if you spend a lot of time at the start uh, doing your requirements gathering, uh, your designing, your planning, before you start building anything, then probably, you know, the bits that get squeezed are the last steps, which are actually where you produce something, where you check it, where you, you know, put the steps in to make sure it's maintainable. So the actual product you get at the end of a fixed time might be, you know, much less than you were hoping for and much less than you have in your design documents. So I think this is like probably quite common pitfalls that a lot of projects um, have and still do uh, fall into. So what can we do instead? So at some point, um, a bunch of software developers came up with what they call the Agile Manifesto. Uh, and they produced a sort of Christmas card-like image, uh, which this doesn't maybe say what it is in itself, but it sort of says the values which are tried, um, it tries to encapsulate. So, as I say, they, they value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. They value working software over comprehensive documentation. They value customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. And that's not to say um, that they, they think the things on the right are important, aren't important. I mean, they are, they are important. It's good to have documentation. It's good to, you know, have processes and tools and so on. But they just think that things on the left are more important. And if you have to make a prioritization, then you should um, always put more heavy emphasis on the things on the left of those, um, of those lines. So in practice, um, I'm sort of like lumping in here agile and iterative together, because I, I think it's kind of iteration is the key um, aspect of, of agile methodologies. Um, and yeah, the main idea is you, you build something quickly, you get something off the ground uh, that you can show to people and that will do something um, as quickly as you can. And this is called a minimal viable product or MVP. Um, and you often hear this term sort of bandied around in, in, in sort of agile uh, projects. Uh, and then once you have that MVP, then you can iterate and you can improve it and you can add features. And probably, yeah, there, there's, there's always two ways you can improve something. You can sort of improve um the the robustness and the performance and the sort of like how well if it's software how well it's written and so on and how well it's documented or you can add new features and i think that's that's um it's a it's a choice for every project on what's important at what point but but the idea is that you're never very far from having a, a working product that can do something that your customer if there is one can look at and say what they like or what they don't like what they want to add next so you go around in the cycle, adding adding new features, uh, and just sort of continuously getting feedback and continuously iterating. Um, so there are various sort of um, 
I guess, flavors of, of, of agile, various sort of like methodologies, which you can sort of concretely do to implement an agile um, workflow. Uh, I'll just talk about two of them um, today. So one of the most sort of straightforward, I think is, is called Kanban. Uh, and this is basically, um, you have, it's based around a Kanban board uh, where you have different categories for things which are to do, uh, to be done or doing now and then done. Or maybe you, you may also have different stages beyond this for like um, different levels of review and sort of sign off. But the idea is like tasks move across the board um, as people do them and hopefully they all end up at the right of the board and then, then, then your project is, is done. A crucial step, which is also true of all agile methods, is to split the work up into small uh, manageable chunks. Um, so something which like, let's say one person can do in you know, a few hours, a day, a day or two, but just something like which I can really say, this is a well-defined bit of work and I can define when it is done. So you put these sort of little chunks in the to-do section, then generally you'll be working with a team. Someone in the team will, will basically like assign that task to themselves and they'll move it into the, the uh, in progress section. And then when they're finished with it, then maybe it'll go to a review section or maybe it'll just go to a, a done section in the simplest case. Um, so yeah, and this board, it can be a physical board. M many times when people you know, used to work in the office together, this would be like something like um, you know, uh, a pin board and, uh, or just a whiteboard or something. And you can write these tasks on post-it notes. So that's what the, the image in my uh, title slide was. It's like you know, little tasks written on post-its. Um, but there are many software tools you can do as well to have a sort of a virtual Kanban board, um, which can work just as well or even better perhaps. Um, so yeah, a great thing about this sort of Kanban method is just sort of the, the flexibility and transparency. So everyone can really see what everyone is doing. They can you know, offer help or um, advice if, if someone's doing something which is in their realm of expertise. Um, you can sort of adapt and prioritize quite quickly because all the, the chunks of work are quite small and self-contained. Um, and it just like really helps you get a visual representation of how the project is, is progressing. So um, another flavor, which is quite popular, well, I'm not sure, yeah, the fashions change. Like when I last did a training course, then this seemed to be the up and coming um, sort of popular implementation of, of Agile is called Scrum. So this is a very uh, prescriptive um, method, let's say, which has lots of, uh, lots of words for things, which, you know, there is a sort of whole vocabulary to itself. Um, and I won't cover them all here because I think maybe you don't need to know all of them. Uh, but generally, you, you'll have a scrum team, which will be maybe five, six, seven, eight people. In every scrum team, you have a product owner who maybe works for the customer or maybe is just a works for your organization, but is sort of a representative of um, the, the, the customer or stakeholder. You have a scrum master and then you have some developers who, who actually um, you know, do the make the thing that you want to make. And then. Um, yeah, we in Scrum, all work is sort of divided up into sprints, which could be a week or two weeks. And the aim is always that you release a new increment of your product, or whatever that is, uh, at the end of each sprint. Um, we also have a lot of um, sort of fixed things within a sprint. So you have a, a sprint planning meeting at the start of each week or each two weeks. And in that you have, again, you have all the, the, the chunks of work sort of divided up into to manageable day or a couple of day type things. Uh, on what's called a backlog, and you have a product backlog, which is everything, and then you put things onto your sprint backlog, which is what we're going to do this week, let's say. Um, and then again, it can be you can have a sort of Kanban style um, board without within the sprint, where you kind of move things across from left to right as you get the individual tasks done. And the sprint planning is a crucial uh, bit of the Scrum methodology, and similarly, you have um, at the end of each sprint, you have a sprint review where you talk about. Um, what you've done and you know how you think this new iteration of your product is is, is useful um, and then you also have a retrospective where you sort of examine how the actual working went uh, what bits went well maybe you overestimated the time it would take for this thing maybe you underestimated the time it would take for this thing um, were there any sort of you know ways that the team didn't work well together perhaps um, and that's sort of a crucial point to make sure that the next sprint is more successful than the previous one um, at every point and then within the sprints, you also have a daily stand-up meeting 
So this is ideally, again, if you're going to follow the prescription, um, everyone stands up uh, in a circle, but probably, you know, in the, the modern world, it'll quite often be virtual. I know they're very short. They're, they're run by the Scrum Master. And in principle, everyone just answers three questions. They just say what they did yesterday, what they're going to do today, and what blockers they have, which are preventing them doing what they want to be doing today. So it should be like, you know, a very, very short meeting, um, but it happens every day. Uh, so that's, that's Scrum. Um, so, yeah, it, I think it's important to note that um, although Agile came about in the sort of realm of software development, you can apply it to any sort of project management. It's not just software projects. But there are also a couple of Agile um, things which are specifically about uh, software. And I guess since quite a few of us here probably do quite a lot of software development, just mention them very briefly. So pair programming, which I think is a, um, yeah, I think very useful and very powerful method. Um, it is part of the sort of agile, as under the agile umbrella. This is where you have two people sitting at the same workstation, writing a bit of code, and generally one person's doing the typing, the other person's um, just looking at what they're typing, but you're constantly talking. So you're talking about, you know, what, why you're writing what you are, how, what problem you're trying to solve, how you're going to go about solving it, what comes next. Um, and so, you know, even though naively you might think, well, you're harming the number of people who are actually writing code, actually you end up with better quality code, um, you probably solve problems faster with, with two brains, and it just helps a lot, I think, in, um, yeah, just just um, getting getting things right without having to sort of, um, you know, rewrite and refactor too many times. Um, so even though it does take a bit of practice, and you do have to really trust each other to do this, it is a very powerful method, I think. Uh, then there's also test-driven development, which um, personally I always try to do, and at some point I always kind of like, fail to carry on doing, uh, but it's a good thing to aim for again, is um, the idea is before you do any code to do anything, you write a test for what it should do, and that test will fail, and then you write the code that will make it pass. And so if your program is sort of divided up into small enough chunks, you can write you know, very small uh, units of code and very, and very specific tests, test for those, and then eventually it will build up into um, you know, a working bit of software and you already have then the, the tests to make sure that it continues to work as you change other things as well. So it's a, again, a very powerful um, software development tool. Um, okay, but so how uh, should one get started um, using agile methods? Uh, I, I think that there are many different agile methods and then sometimes it can be a bit daunting to sort of try and change the way you're working to, to adopt them. But I think you can always take little bits from it and then sort of just adapt gradually to, to become more agile if that's if that's what you want to do. And I think the most important one and the most, um, yeah, sometimes the most difficult skill, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's very hard, I think, uh, is to break your project down into the chunks. So, you know, you'll have a whole big project. Then within this, there'll be several sort of milestones, which are kind of like fairly, fairly major pieces of work. Uh, then if you break those down further into sort of, again, things which you can do in anything from a few hours to a couple of days, uh, it's a really important um, thinking exercise, I guess. Like, uh, it's not always obvious how to do it, but it can sometimes help you really um, quantify what needs to be done in order for something to later down the line to work, as opposed to just having a huge chunk of work out of you that you just sort of uh, get stuck in. And I think, again, a Kanban board, uh, once you have that, is, is, is actually a really simple and easy way um, to track the progress. And it's a good way of working with a team as well. Um, so, you know, I think it's pretty much every project I work on now, then we'll have, you know, a Kanban board uh, and, um, you yeah, we'll sort of break the tasks down, have uh, a to do, doing, done, review section. Um, and so several packages um, offer this. Uh, and one of them, like if you're using GitHub anyway, then every GitHub repository has a projects uh, tab. Um, and, and this you can easily set up to be a Kanban board. Um, and as an example of that, then the Turing Way, which, which always comes up <laughs> but as a great example of uh, a sort of a model open source project. Um, so here again, you can see this, this Kanban board, you've got the three columns for to do uh, in progress and done. And actually just as an extra step uh, in, in the Turing Way one, then um, it's kind of all automated. So as issues get closed, then you know the software will move the um, the uh, the different um, cards across the uh, across the Kanban board. So yeah, I think I think GitHub is, is a nice 
implementation of, of uh, that makes it easy to do Kanban, but there are also many others as well that, that, that are generally free and uh, easy to use. Okay, so yeah, to summarize, um, you know, I think uh, agile methods, uh, although they were a bit initially for software development, I think they can be applied to anything and they, they do um, avoid some of the pitfalls of the waterfall method. So you, you generally, you're never very far from having a working product that you can show to someone and get feedback. And I think that's a very useful uh, way of working and it means you can get feedback and incorporate it a lot faster. Um, so I think there are definitely many useful aspects of Agile that, that any of us can take and, and apply to pretty much any project. Um, my, my personal opinion, having been on a week long Scrum training course that cost my old employee lots of money, I, I think that might work, uh, but it probably works best in some circumstances, particularly where you have a team which is really focusing on one particular project uh, and not doing anything else. And that's not the case with my current job and probably it's not the case for many people working in academia or research where your time is a bit more split between different things you have to do. I think that's not really a, a comfortable fit with the very prescriptive um, schedule of something like Scrum. I do still think that there are many bits um, of agile methodology that that you know may be useful for many other people. So, let's say for myself, I, I I always use Kanban boards. I do try and divide, divide work into chunks. I do try and do test driven developments uh, and pair programming when I can. And I think it's more yes, yeah, more a case of what's finding out what works for you and and adopting those bits and experimenting a bit, I guess, and just um, yeah, see see what uh, what what improves your your workflow. Um, yeah, so that's more or less it for me, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, Nick, I'll have to ask you to stay on call, uh, but because of lack of time, we'll be sending people off to breakout room while they're away. We're going to ask you lots of questions because we have it on Etherpad. <laughs> okay. Folks, you'll have to just come back to this video and we'll try to take notes while you're away. We have a breakout room actually to discuss iterative project management and design. Um, in this, we want you to test what Nick was just talking about. Last week, you made roadmap for yourself where you set certain uh, milestones. And we ask you to choose one milestone, go into the breakout room, try to chunk them down and discuss with each other. Um, you will see the instruction from line number 212. We will again have written discussion room uh, and the spoken discussion room. Please follow the instruction as is. I hope that is clear. Amy, are we ready to send them? Awesome. So have fun while I'll be talking to Nick. Harpreet, I just want to check with you quickly if you want to be in the spoken or written room. Or you can just hang out with us, really. It would make us look like yes, a I, full room. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Nick, uh, first question. I would, I would start easily. What is your favorite flavor of agile development? Um, yeah, so I, I think keeping it simple is, is, is my personal preference. So I, I quite like Kanban, I think um, just, you know, I think it sort of distills what what uh, what benefits you can get quite nicely, and, and it yeah, it's it's helpful without being too um, yeah prescriptive is a word I keep on using, but I think yeah, it doesn't have too many rules basically, I guess. Um, and then I'll ask my question because it's also simple. Do you think Scrum is actually really productive or exhausting? As in, do people feel more burned out in such intense working mode? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think I, I think it works for some people and some teams. Um, I think it's a bit of a shame if if an organisation decides top down that this is what we'll all do, and probably you know some people uh, are less happy with it than others. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I've never been in an organisation organisation where it's like worked that effectively, and I, and I do think that like having all these meetings can can burn people out a little bit, maybe. Um, and sort of the pressure to get things done, you know, by the end of a sprint, I think is maybe not necessarily um, that helpful in all the situations. But but I think there are probably, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be as widely used as it is if it, if it wasn't successful in some situations. 
Yeah, I was just curious because I would feel quite uh, overwhelmed in that environment if I have to deliver every time in two weeks. Mm, um, yeah. Just quick check, Nadine, are you okay? So Nick, may I ask a question? Uh, so I was thinking of uh, that uh, as an academician, uh, we are more into like uh, uh, curriculum design and uh, mapping of program outcome, course outcome and all these things. Uh, so I was just thinking uh, that, that have you thought of uh, ever or, or can you suggest applying Agile uh, to uh, this, this huge work of uh, curriculum planning uh, and development? Mm, interesting, yeah. Um... I guess it's something which you can do um, iteratively, because uh, I guess, yeah, it, I, it's not something I've ever really done myself. So, so I, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't say I, I would, uh, have a great idea, but I think uh, maybe just the idea of like having a first sketch of a curriculum and then iteratively improving it, um, ideally, but again, based on feedback and based on what, uh, what the various stakeholders um, uh, like or don't like about your your first go, is that is in itself an agile approach, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. And as far as sort of dividing it up into smaller chunks and smaller tasks, um, maybe <laughs> I'm not sure what those would be exactly. Uh, it's, yeah, um, it's worth it's worth thinking about. But I, I do think the iterative approach probably can apply to that. I would I would think. Um, Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Harpreet. Uh, I might have lost a little bit track of the questions, <laughs> but um, but let's see. Um, this is a long one. Um, <laughs> so there seems to be a small a focus on small bite-sized tasks. Uh, so this person is wondering how one cannot lose can not lose track of what the overall big or immediate goal is yeah with so respect to the final aim that's yeah it's a good question um so i think this is where these different backlogs come in i mean there are lot again there's lots of different words within the agile community there's things like epics and uh, uh there's yeah a bunch of these but the idea is you have um everything in the entire project is is goes on it is in principle some sort of task and that goes on the, the, the product backlog. And then you have, if you're doing some sort of sprint based agile, then you'll have what you want to do in the next week or two um, on a sprint backlog. And hopefully these are all sort of relatively self-consistent. Um, it's kind of, uh, if you're on a, again, a scrum type method, then it's kind of responsibility of the, the product owner, I think, is to keep track of the big picture and see how everything fits into the big picture. Um, it's, it's not, not to say it's not helpful if the developers don't also have that in mind, but I think, um, yeah, the, the, I guess part of the idea is to free them from worrying too much about it. They, they focus on what they're doing uh, in a sort of short time scale and, um, you know, hopefully it will contribute to the big picture and, uh, and then, yeah, it'll all sort of iterate through and sort of be added to, to whatever product you're, you're doing and hopefully you should even see that quite quickly like uh, how how it affects or improves the, the product that you're making thank you um one from manu um it's a, a little bit of a long one but bear with bear with us um if you want to extend an existing standard for your project but the extension is substantial how do you keep your development lean if you eventually want to get your changes into the standard um, it seems like the bigger uh, existing communities can take very long to incorporate new things and have community consensus. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think so. So, so basically, sort of contributing to an existing project. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I think uh, you you are at some level, as you say, you are sort of at the mercy of the, the schedule of, of the maintainers of, of that original um, project. I think you you can you can try and be as agile as you you can be in in your um, in the work that you're contributing, um, but yeah, that that is true. That is it's quite hard to sort of um, necessarily see that uh, reflected in in the final product if if that's a schedule under someone else's control. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure what the best answer is there. I guess, I guess you just sort of worry about the things that are under your control. You, you sort of do what you can as best you can, and um, uh, that might end up you end you end up generating like lots of pull requests or lots of issues, which then have to filter through in their own time. But, but yeah, just have to take care of the bits you can control. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great answer. Um, do the best we can. <laughs> And, and, and within the within the, the communities and, and projects that we have control over and hopefully influences um, hopefully it makes people see sort of the, the advantages uh, and how to do these uh, in an agile way as well. Um, I'm bringing people back in about 36 seconds. So um, thank you so much, Nick, for taking the time to address all these questions. Um, we try to take notes as much as we can. Of course, it's all on the recording. So uh, if, you, if you have some time, feel free to go through the notes and and amend <laughs> what we've said, but of course that's not, uh, it's not compulsory, it's not necessary. Um, uh, hopefully we, everyone okay. will learn. Yeah, but thank you so much for, for joining us. No problem, yeah. Um, shall, I, shall I hang around uh, a bit longer then or? Uh, Feel free yeah. to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, home well, folks, our next speaker will be here, is oh, already no. here. <laughs> okay. yeah. I'll have to jump thanks, on with you, but uh, anyway, yeah, thanks for, thanks for Thank you. Me. All right, folks. Usually we cut people off middle of discussion. Sorry about that. <laughs> but I hope I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, Mavika, do you want to say a quick word about this exercise? Yeah, I just want to do a gut check in 30 seconds. Can you tell us your experience? Did you find that experience tough, challenging, surprising, useful? You can give me emojis. You can use the chat to tell us, or you can even raise hand and, and mute and tell. So I hear from Saranjit, very useful. Can Aaron, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Malvika. Um, yeah, I did a very quick, uh, uh, yeah, divided everything very quick into chunks, but it I mean, immediately realized that uh, there's a lot of concrete things that I can write down. Uh, and yeah, within one minute, I realized what I had to do. So that was nice. <laughs> that's that's great. I was worried that you'll say oh, eight minutes wasn't enough, but which I would have said, of course, it's not enough because you'll have to go back and probably do it again. We have an assignment today, but we have our last speaker here. Amy, I'm going to give it to you because my niece and nephews are shouting at the background. Nice. Uh, my pleasure to have Home Folk Dan with us today. Um, She's going to talk about an open hardware project that is extremely exciting. I'll leave the floor for her. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Amy, for the introduction. Uh, let me uh, first share my screen. Um, I hope that you can see my screen. Can you? Yeah, perfect. Oh, you were in presentation mode just now. Now we see this. Uh, oh yeah, you're back. Okay, so 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 so, so uh, you can see me also, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna talk about this um, uh, pocket sign lab uh, project. So um, AMB said I'm from uh, Force Asia. So Force Asia is an organization based out of um, Singapore, but we connected with the open source contributors from everywhere around Asia and also um, in Europe. Uh, we develop um, different uh, uh, open source uh, projects. And today I'm talking about this um, hardware project, Pocket Sign Lab. So first I will introduce a little bit what is uh, the project about, and then I tell you um, the journey, uh, how we get here today and talk a little bit about uh, our um, development process, uh, how we worked with the community um, in charge of us, um, a hardware project. Uh, so Pocket Sign Lab is um, a hardware device, it's like a board, uh, it combines multiple measurement fun uh, functions in one board. Uh, so here on the screen you can see uh, uh, a few highlights of what the device be able to do. So 
um, is similar to, to the Arena. It's not the Arena because it have like it's a, a special function, so you can use it as oscilloscope, a multimeter logic analyzer, wave generator, um, uh, um, like. Another thing that uh, is good with is uh, you can uh, we we have uh, like different pins uh, in the pack, but you can um, connect with different sensor and measure um, data. So uh, measure uh, what you can Im imagine wh whatever sensor that work with. For instance, if you work with the Arena wall before, it's all compatible with the Pocket Science Lab. So the whole idea of this device is to enable people um, uh, to um, uh, to gather data, to learn like beginner, to learn electronics uh, that have something they can experiment with. Um, how does this uh, device work? Um, basically, uh, we, you connect with um, a mobile phone. There is an app. It's also open source uh, that we built to, to, to control the device. You can also install it, the, the app um, on your laptop. So we have a Python uh, web app. It works um, uh, with um, the machine, apply machine as well. So basically, um, who are using the device? Um, could be teachers, uh, students who like beginner who who want to um, uh, to get into the uh, electronics uh, uh, field. Uh, we have a lot of hobbyists who hack into the device, uh, and some uh, makers um, and hackers they also want to have um, a more uh, sportable uh, to help them to, uh, with their work. Um, yeah, so let's be continue. As I mentioned before, you see here on the screen that is uh, Illustrate, uh, the mobile phone that can connect and, 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 and the, 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 the user interface, the UI that you see, uh, we try to replicate as much as possible what you see in a real oscilloscope, but now it's uh, like on, on your handheld device. Okay, so that is a little bit about the device. I can go into the detail about the application of it later, but I now want to talk about the story why Force Asia community start to work on this hardware um, project. So for many years, we've been involved a lot in, we develop mostly software, yeah? Like many other open source uh, organization out there, we have uh, different software projects. We have our own event management system. We have um, Linux distribution. We have search engine and, um, and, and other uh, software projects. Uh, uh, we um, like, like similar to other open source organizations, we have one annual event where we invite our contributors get together to share the idea. And um, in 2014, at one of our events, uh, we have uh, one uh, of the um, participants, uh, Praveen Patel is a teacher, physics teacher from India. He came to us uh, with a problem. He told us that um, uh, it's quite uh, challenging for him to get students uh, in his school excited about science topic to conduct experiment because uh, they they have very limited um, access to the lab. So uh, the, the whole school only have one lab, and students only get maybe one um, one out one lesson, which is about 45 minutes um, uh, per week, where the whole 40 students get together and um, difficult to do experiment, difficult to for them to, to follow what written in, in the textbook. And he said that, oh, okay, so many people doing a uh, cool thing here it would be so nice if we have a device that people can work together and which is more affordable, that students can, can learn better, yeah? Uh, and then uh, because of his uh, idea, so, so we said, okay, so that could be an interesting uh, topic to look into, into, and then we give out a call to the community if they, at first at the event, we just asked, okay, if you're aware of any uh, like similar project going on, please share with us. And then uh, the community member uh, brought to us the, the C Laplet. So this is another project, uh, original version. We would say the original version of the Pocket Sign Lab. This is a device, um, a device designed, designed by um, a developer from, from India. Yeah, it's also um, uh, his father was a, a professor at a university, a senior scientist. So they also have a similar idea. They they want to have a, 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 a portable um, a measurement device. Uh, so they start with this, but the, this device, the C tablet, was not open. It was not an open uh, project. But this is something that we base our um, development on. 
Yeah. So uh, so later on, we uh, we met with the developer. We convinced them that uh, it was it would be a, a great idea to open up the development so that people in the community can participate. And at one point, uh, he agreed to release um, the blueprint, the design file of of this hardware. Yeah, and from uh, the the very uh, beginning, uh, this device, uh, we uh, we open up the project to community and people start to work on it. So we so several uh, iteration, uh, several um, uh, version of the device come coming up after I think about one year or one and a half year. And then uh, later on, it's come uh, like uh, this is something that that optimized um, with the with the frame of the Arino Mega. The reason why we we have it that frame because we thought that if we uh, follow something uh, that available in the industry, we can easily uh, use the existing case that they already develop for the more. So this is something that we um, uh, come together um, as like. The next level of uh, of the uh, pocket lab based on the the very beginning seed lab uh, leaflet, and um, yeah. So and then from this uh, this version more development, we we moved into the pocket science lab, and um, and currently uh, the the current version right now you see you will see on um, uh, later on. But um, let's uh, look a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about. Um, what is it exactly? So I just show you some screenshot about the application of the device. Uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned before, the core function in the oscilloscope. Um, it works together with your uh, phone or your uh, or your laptop, and this is one function that a lot of lab um, uh, and maker using this for. That's one use case, and another thing that people use work as a science lab to um, connect with uh, uh, another uh, hardware they design. This is designed by the community robot, robotic arm, um, and used to be at lab to to control is the um, this project also released on um, uh, uh, on GitHub the the public repository. Um, and this is another example of how people, how the student connect uh, with a sensor to, to measure distances. And recently, uh, what we do, uh, we have a collaboration with um, biologists here in, um, in Germany to, um, to use the, the BS lab uh, in connection with a spectrometer. Yeah, so this is a few application of like something that we build in the community and have the use cases in uh, in the society and in like real life youth use cases and application yeah so um uh, uh, this is an overview of the development so far. Uh, as you see here from the C leaflet, something that uh, minimal design close us, and then we uh, develop into the PS lab hardware completely open source. And then from the hardware, you see here at different point and different uh, project that combine together in ecosystem. So when we talk about hardware, it's not only about the design of uh, of the hardware and 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 and, and the production of the hardware itself. A lot of different. Um, uh, components that need to work together to have the the complete uh, projects uh, like the business lab so we have the, the desktop application we have the the android application and we also have the the web app so in this uh, uh, um, what you say we could say it's got a roadmap you can see very clearly different uh, area where the community can engage and can work together with us so if you have an interest in in the hardware people would join the the beat lab uh, beat lab hardware if people are interested in the software, there's different options they can work on Android if they are um, into like uh, mobile development with, with Java strip and then with the desktop are people who who are familiar with, with Python and shut. So this is a different uh, uh, smaller community inside this uh, this um, PS Lab project. Um, uh, the development. So, um, uh, just a little bit about the development of of the BS Lab from the very beginning, and when we uh, 
started to work on the project, we convinced the original author of the very small device at that time, the, the, the sea lab that did not have a lot of features than what, than, than what, we, like what we have today. We convinced them that it's a, um, a, a, a good idea to open up to the, the development to the community. So all the projects that I showed you earlier, the, the hardware, desktop uh, application, Android, um, or the Python script, everything available now on, uh, on GitHub. So we open up uh, the whole development. So uh, you can find the view of material, the design file, even for the case, code everything um, on the public repository. We use something that Nick uh, also showed earlier in the Agile methods, we use issue checking. So issue checking is a way to communicate what you want to do next in your project. So, uh, so the maintainer of the project uh, will document um, all the features and also issue, it could also be like bugs coming from the community. There are different level of, of issue, uh, a set of feature, a set of bugs and everything available on the public issue checking. So people from the community can see what, um, what are the challenges and what are the next step that the, that the project aiming for. Yeah, so so basically using GitHub, uh, GitHub or GitLab, whatever like um, the the so called management out there is a way to create a virtual environment for uh, people to communicate. But instead of speaking on on a call like this, they can communicate directly on um, on the project um, uh, issue checking. Uh, make development flow clear and structured. So this is something, if you look at the repository, it's always come with a readme file and contribution guidelines. So uh, how people can contribute, how people can set up their own uh, development environment. This is really important to engage uh, with newcomers um, um, or people who, who want to get into the project. So what we learned so far, always have a, a readme file, always have the um, contribution um, uh, guidelines and show people how, how they can set up their project. If they cannot set up their project on, on their local machine, it's very difficult for them to, to contribute. Um, something that uh, Nick also mentioned, previous um, uh, presenter talked about uh, Strum in Archive. However, in open source uh, project development, people don't come together in one room. Yeah, so people work together from all over uh, the places, but we can also uh, do, uh, do Strum on, um, on a virtual setting. So we have every project um, that we manage under the Force Asia, we have our own um, mailing list. Um, the people who work on the contributor who work on the project, they can try to uh, share the update uh, via uh, uh, email, follow the, uh, the, the Strum uh, format. So they will say, what did they do yesterday? What they plan to do today? And what prevent them from doing their work so that the community and this email sending out to the all people sub subscribe to the mailing list and they can get feedback and the other people see also and get a little bit of feeling uh, where the development going forward. Yeah, um, uh, use uh, chat for quick exchange. So basically we, um, um, uh, uh, we also have a chat channel, mailing list chat channel, we use uh, Gitter. So Gitter, why Gitter, but not IRC or, or other method. The reason why we use Gitter because it's interacted with, uh, uh, with GitHub so that you, you can really reference the issue very quickly. So you can reference the issue and people can uh, go and check into the detail of the issue. Um, directly, so it's quite handy if you really like focus on uh, development, not about like your social inter interactions. Yeah. Um, um, yes, and then uh, the, uh, the 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 projects that they always want to focus. Okay, so we focus on do code, and we do less uh, discussion on this like following chat. Even if not if anything that's not related to the project, then people would be asked to to have the conversation elsewhere because this uh, chat, the project chat is documented everything related to um, issue checking related to the project development, and and people can go back and easily search for any conversation. Amy, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I'm going over time. Um, is, is there, um, can I do uh, still um, the presentation or? Yeah, um, yeah don't, 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 don't worry too much. I think Malvika is putting down the assignments in the chat as we go. So folks, if you need to hop off, please do. Um, sorry, we usually run out of time, but this is really interesting. So please do keep going. Uh,
Okay, so I, I'm almost done. Um, yes, so, so, so this is uh, about the chat. And then we also have something that I mentioned briefly before, um, uh, the contribution uh, um, guidelines. So we have, uh, we introduced um, a few policy uh, that aim for um, a scalable, a scalable development. So people, uh, you know, in an open source setting, people come in and out all the time. Not that uh, they always have time to constantly stay on on the project. So you need to, to anticipate once a developer leave um, the project, what will happen uh, with the future of the project. So documentation, I think that um, uh, previous uh, speakers already mentioned a few times about they like, have very good documentation um, that help with the development. And one thing that we um, also introduce, um, every pull request need to associate with one issue so that if you only open the pull request and people have no contact, it's difficult for someone who, who do not play, um, who, who is not actively uh, involved, we get um, uh, understand uh, what we are working on. So um, always, always match uh, each pull request with an issue. Break a big issue into multiple small issues is also easier for for someone who review. Yeah, so we encourage people to um, if something that you don't think that you can resolve within a day or something, uh, break it down to smaller issue. It's all not only like uh, helps you to, to 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 see that there is a goal that uh, the contribute uh, uh, contributor have a goal, a clear goal that they can okay fix this issue in the uh, reasonable time, uh, time frame at the same time the reviewers and the maintainers do not have um, do not have to spend so much time in review like hundreds or thousands of li lines of code yeah establish uh, a peer review process even um, the admin or the maintainer of the project they cannot just like simply much um, a pull request we always need a second eye um, second pair of eyes to, to review um, whatever pull requ requests are coming in so we we um, um, like encourage people from the community to, to help each other review pull requests and also provide comment into the pull request and then the um, the right access. So not everyone will be able to to earn the right access, but we, we want to show our big appreciation to the contributors by giving out uh, the right access to to active contributors. Yeah. It make things easier for project maintainers. So this is also something that uh, that we encourage the community and uh, um, contributor to keep in mind because you know only a few maintainers are there and manage like multiple projects. So making things easy for the maintainers is also something that we really paid attention to. For instance, have a very clear description of the issue of the pull request, what you are working on and open the pull request as soon as um, possible. You can open pull request like a draft to get a feedback um, uh, early. Uh, and it's also um, easier for, for the maintainer to review or, or merge it later. Yeah. Um, um, Motive, um, motivate um, developer to work um, on the project. So there's also a few things that we do to, um, to engage with our people. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not so, um, there's so many open source projects out there and we always like, have similar uh, challenge, uh, challenges and, um, and struggling to keep um, uh, contributors on board. Um, so there's also like, like some, um, some approaches that we use to try to um, motivate our people, for instance, um, give recognition. So recognition could be could come in different form. Could be uh, some could be funding, could be um, a travel to a conference, or could be a very nice message to, to show you them that you, you appreciate. So I, I think I saw something that also worked very well. Whenever you receive um, uh, a pull request uh, or a contribution or commit um, on your project, it would be very nice to just like say thank you to, to that person and thank that person for, for their work. Um, it's not. Um, it's a small thing, but it's all. It's also show that you care about every single. Um, 
even small or big contribution, and it also makes the contributors feel feel good about their, their engagement. Uh, provide opportunity. So sometimes we also work with um, a university and and company that offer internship and um, um, uh, opportunity for people who work on the project. Of course, we always prioritize on uh, the con um, uh, the contributors, long uh, long term contributor to the project. Okay, uh, so this is something uh, when working to the community, we also uh, go to different conference to present the project and get feedback from uh, from uh, from more experts and, and, and the senior uh, developers. So this is a picture taking at the CCC. So one of the biggest the biggest, I would say, the hacker uh, hacker conference here in um, in Europe, and there we met um, expert in the hardware development and got a lot of uh, good feedback from them to improve the board. So it's really important to open up your de development and always uh, like uh, connect with people um, in the industry and get uh, get their feedback. Yeah, uh, so this is something that uh, producing. So when you 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 do, um, it's quite. It's a bit different than, than doing software. So when you uh, develop open uh, open source hardware, of course, uh, in order to uh, to develop uh, the project, people must have a device. People should have a device um, uh, to work with. Uh, and production is also um, something that uh, it was a really good uh, research and exercise for us. How can an open source community get into the uh, production lie uh, with a very limited resources or, or investment. And uh, we managed to do it. We, find, um, we found a, a partner in China who, who was willing to, to work with us to, um, to produce the pocket science lab. And uh, another partner that, 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 that we also found is um, um, a university here in, in Germany, as, as you know, um, not only COVID, but, but for a long time, we also realized that we cannot always rely on manufacturers in China. As now there is um, a shortage of chips and many other components um, that's not available in the market. So it's always important to, 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 to think of alternatives so if there's no china then where can you produce can you produce locally what uh, what is it that uh, how can you enable um like people um like research lab or, or make a uh, make a lab around you to also produce hardware and work together with them um, and finally just some like very quick um uh, lesson that we learned during the uh, the hardware de development process um we need to understand that like, before we produce something, the creation of a uh, bill of material is a full-time job. A lot of people need to, um, to work together and uh, go through like different iteration before we can have this uh, like today. And if you work, uh, why I, I mentioned here, why we work with China, because it's like the, the easiest way to start. So they offer, they have a lot of manufacturers, but for these facilities uh, there, and this would be, of course, it, it, it is a big advantage if we, we have somebody in the team who could speak um, Mandarin and be aware that like, components can become unavailable within very short time frame so 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 plan your timeline accordingly and um, another a few other thing about like the selection of components yeah um, there's also different uh, uh, level of, of component, uh, very good quality or, or use uh, to manufacture, like reuse the, the components. So it really depends on the how crucial a component uh, is to your project, then you can make your decision uh, accordingly. Um, Yes, and one thing very important: how to test the device. So, so having the piece of material, ha having all things needed for for the production is one thing. But if you, if let's say, if you produce like thousand of devices, what is the best way um, uh, to test uh, the device if you are not there in uh, in China, if you are not directly uh, be together with um, with the manufacturer? So, testing is also a very important aspect of of hardware development. Yeah. Okay, so coming to the end, so uh, Pocket Science Lab continue to develop and we are very happy that uh, we will soon release the next version of the Pocket Science Lab. As you see here, we will add the SD card and um, in the future, we will also be a small battery on the device. So right now you can connect it to the phone to power the device, but in the future, the, the, the device can power itself. And we even think of having a, a screen in the back. So 
doing everything now with the phone, but what if they have an LED uh, stream um, directly on device that you can measure and, 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 and collect the data? Okay, so I think um, it's come to the end. Um, you can check out the project on uh, on GitHub, uh, short for Force Asia, and then um, Beard Lab. Um, there will be a list of uh, the hardware, the Python application, and many more. Um, we distribute the device on beardlab.io in Europe, US also, and um, in Asia. Um, the court is open. You are more than welcome to, to participate in, in the development and talk with us. We run one uh, so week at the open hardware meeting on Saturday. Yeah, so um, to talk about Pocket Sand Lab and, and other similar um, open hardware project, you're also welcome to, to join us. Um, the next uh, Force Asia Summit in April, where we talk more about not only Pocket Sand Lab, but other open source projects by the Force Asia community and other uh, uh, communities around the world as well. Um, yes, I hope to see you there. Um, my name is Hong Fu Tang. Below in my, is my email and social media handles. Thank you very much. Once again, sorry to, to go so much over time. Thank you so much, Hong Kong. Uh, we have a lot of comments saying this is a fantastic project, great project, and re looks really, really good. Um, folks, I, we're over the hour. Um, so if you need to drop off, please do. Malvika, I want, I want to see if you want to go over quickly the assignments and, and next week as well before um, before we hand over back to Hong Kong for, for a question or two. Just one minute, quick overview of what we're going to have in the next week. Uh, you've learned about iterative design, so there will be a connection with that. So we have an assignment, and this document will help you break down your milestone and shorter tasks. And this will also be useful when you're involving other people into your project, so you can give them smaller tasks that matches their profile. So please start developing that. Also, if you haven't yet, please bring your project online, either on GitHub, try making a website if you can. Do you need help? Please uh, contact us on Slack. Uh, we are also going to start working on code of conduct and contribution guideline. If you haven't done that, but this is, this is a long-term plan, so you can come back to this. And finally, as we've learned about Kanban, please start exploring different tools, including the GitHub uh, project board to create project board for yourself and your team. Again, these are all useful assignments. Do what you can. There's no urgency in finishing those. This is for your project, so apply what works best for you. Back to you, Emmy. Thank you, Malvika. Okay, folks, if you need to drop off, please do. Um, but I think, Harpreet, if you don't mind, I think you have two very specific questions. I wonder if you want to just unmute and ask. Maybe go ahead, Emmy, you ask. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so ah, I see already some folks put in the chat about the device being available on PSLab.io. Uh, I think there were very two um, specific questions that we'll try to capture on the recording. Uh, home folk, uh, what is the um, what is the cost? How do you get the device for the students? Yes, so the cost right now, um, so we distribute it on, uh, on that website in different uh, country and around $65. Uh, dollars. So for the next, uh, so we try to bring down the cost like to below 50. Um, and we also distribute it to university in bigger quantity at the discounted price. So we have distributed to um, uh, school in Singapore and also in, in, in Germany and I think that um, also in India. Yeah. Thank you. And I think there's another one on um, whether it can be integrated with Pocket Biolab. Is that the related project or do you know of it? Uh, Pocket Biolab, um, could somebody share a, a little bit about this? So, so we have a different iteration, but I cannot say, uh, is it possible because uh, we need to, to look into the, the details. So we also iterate BS Lab with all the, um, for instance, Sick Rock, right? Um, um, and all, all the sample, but I'm not so sure um, about this. Uh, could you give me the link to this so I can look into? 
I see Herbert uh, responding to on the on the Zoom chat, so maybe you could send a link if you have one. Um, Herbert's asking if they can get a sample. So, ah, there we yeah. go. <laughs> so so I I just wa wondering uh, whether they're working on such idea. This idea just came into my mind uh, that if we have a pocket science, uh, uh, whether we can work. Uh, uh, together on getting a pocket bioscience bioscience lab so that's it's not i don't know whether such type of project, project exists or not this is just an idea which i we may be work uh, or somebody may be working in the future uh, so, so, so the I mentioned in so uh, yes, if I understand correctly, so I'm not aware of uh, that. But the pocket science lab, we work now with a group of biologists here in in Germany in the top lab um, uh, to, um, uh, to 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 have application that use in in biology. I don't know if if that's something that you are looking for. Yes, if you can connect me to. Uh, uh, then, uh, then we can. I can discuss uh, uh, if my idea is similar to their idea, and if we can yes. collaborate, that can be a possible. Yeah. So I put the the, the community uh, chat in the, um, on the note, and uh, and also there is a meeting happening every uh, Saturday. I will put the link there as well. So you're more than welcome to come and talk to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And and just a, just a question. Uh, as you are asking uh, uh, that you are you have provided this uh, device to some universities on a discounted price. Uh, so is it possible if we can have one sample uh, so that we can demonstrate to uh, the students and other uh, you know persons? And uh, then we where, can. Where we can are have, you at the moment? I am from India. I am from India, Punjab. Yes. So if you can just uh, write an email um, to us, and then we we see if we can um, give you a discounted one um, uh, to your school to try it out. So this is an email um, that I put on on the chat. You can just write to the office because they also have they like, taking care of the inventory. They would know if we have some way to to sh ship it to you to to India. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much, Hongfuk. I'm going to stop the recording at this point. Let me just do that. Good to see you, Emmy. <laughs>